Now I'm going to take you to the lower lakes, which um, Tony talked about briefly, but you know where we are in the lower lakes, and you will um, remember that this place has been drying up. Now that should be a little video in the corner. I'm not sure if you can work it up there, but this is really where we've had a, dr a dredge parked in the mouth of the Murray for some time now and at about $100,000 a week in terms of cost. So it's important to sort of realise that there are real costs of the way we're doing our business. And if we look at, um, and, and Tony looked, showed us that photograph of, of where the water levels were, this is water levels in Lake Alexandrina modelled and using real data over time. And as you can see, uh, it went through this uh, crash in um, you know, 2008, 2009. Come back again, obviously, with the floods down the Darling and down the River Murray. There have been major ecological changes in this system. Water levels perhaps um, below sea level for the first time in 7,000 years. Uh, median flows, 29% of nat natural. But what we have started to see in, at that point was a marine takeover of freshwater environments. And, and the most poignant of those are the tortoises, which uh, get these um, sea, sea um, worms colonising their backs so that they eventually drown because they can't come up for air. But we've also seen exposure of acid sulphate soils and declining shorebird population all symptomatic of some major issues and increasing salinity. And I suppose it, it does beg the question, is there a way we could actually do business a bit differently in this system? So if you look at the last drought um, and the drought period and look at what natural flows would have made it through there, um, they're quite significant ones that wouldn't have got us into that place. Compared that to where we actually saw things happening and you can see a flat line impact as a result of um, no, not much water coming down the system. You could actually raise the level of those low flows, so you avoid these sort of disasters in the future. But it would require, obviously, more flow in this system. And our estimates are that you would, if you had a rule in there about raising uh, to one third of natural, so it's not getting it back to time before colonisation or anything, um, you could actually avoid the sorts of disasters that we've seen in this system. So there are some real economic costs of doing business as usual. Um, uh, Tony's talked about increasing salinity, blue-green algal blooms, acidification. One that's not talked about very much is the loss of productivity on floodplains. Uh, the Murray-Darling has about 30,000 wetlands, uh, about 6 million hectares of floodplains and most of those, sorry, wetlands, most of those are floodplains um, and most of them are privately owned. They're owned by rural people who rely to a large extent on the floods coming down these systems. And there are some estimates of about an, an impact in terms of reductions of water resource development of uh, 10 times, particularly in places like the Macquarie Marshes in terms of loss of um, agricultural productivity. Fisheries and tourism, again, are areas that we know would benefit in terms of environmental flows. There are lots of other ecosystem services. There are pollinators, pest controllers. Uh, we did some estimates about the cost of dealing with the problem in the lower lakes and the Coorong, and in terms of millions of dollars, and here we're talking about dealing with the symptoms, we're not actually dealing with the cause, uh, the dollars are significantly um, add up over time if you think about cracking levees, lost irrigation production, riverbank slumping, monitoring and planning, uh, the desalination plant in Adelaide, 1.4 billion. So you're looking at more than 2 billion to deal with the lower lakes and the Coorong and lack of flows down the lower part of the Murray. And then we mustn't forget it does cost a lot of money for governments to actually manage regulated rivers. And so there are costs, hidden costs in there in terms of uh, the equation around environmental flows and irrigation. So I guess I wanted to end and, and not talk about the basin plan because there's a lot of colour and movement around there and I'm sure um, lots of people and Craig's got the unenviable job of charting that, that uh, path. But I wanted to talk about, well, what are we going to do after we've got the basin plan in place and what are the challenges there? 
And I, I suppose I think we need um, sustainable river systems where we're growing more with less. And we know we can do that. We've shown we can do that. And uh, the data that um, Tony's shown is, 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 is telling us that. I think increasingly there will be a green economy around rivers. Um, people will be rewarded for being good water managers or catchments potentially, and other catchments may be penalised for, for not in terms of the markets. Now, we're already, I know one very good example, for example, in, in terms of irrigation and the cut flower market in Africa, where water levels are being lowered considerably in Lake Naivasha, and that's being, they, those producers are being penalised by the markets in, in Europe. So I think we probably will see a bit more of that in the future. I think there are maybe opportunities in the future past the pur water purchase program for private people to buy back water for river systems. Uh, they may want to do that in the same way that people do that in terms of the national park system. From an environment point of view, we do need to get into the triage game in a sense we're doing that. And we have to consolidate our efforts on those systems that really are intact, those ones that we think are resilient. Uh, important to be professional about we, the way we manage our systems. Uh, what are the environmental flow regimes we're trying to do uh, with less water? What's the monitoring and the learning that we're going to, actually going to get from that? And we don't seem to do a lot of that. It's about buying back water currently. It's not about learning how we do it better. And as I mentioned, particularly things like the Macquarie Marshes, there are lots of other things in river systems not necessarily related to flows that are important in terms of ecosystem health, and we need to deal with those. Thanks very much. <laughs>